Welcome to church this morning. I think uh, you might have to start coming a little bit earlier if you want to get uh, your chosen seat. I think there's only maybe one or two seats left open, but this is great to see so many people here. Uh, I feel thankful this morning because this is the first day that I have thrown away my winter jacket and I'm wearing my spring jacket. So uh, hopefully it keeps up. Uh, there's a couple of announcements that I'll make before uh, I know two or three people have asked if they can make announcements. Some were asking about the uh, masks. We're going to keep the masks on for one more week. We decided as an opening group that we would wait till April 1st, two weeks after the government mandated was lifted. So possibly, I will send out a, a notice, uh, in two weeks we will recommend masks. Those that want to wear them, that's fine. Those that don't want to wear them, that's also fine. So check your news and notes in the next uh, week or so. Uh, when we're singing this morning, Let's get a little bit of exercise, and maybe if you feel the need and you're able, stand and we'll, we'll sing. And uh, I'm not sure, am I, am I allowed to sing up here with my mask off or do I have to put it on? I, uh, I joke with uh, some of my friends that, uh, you know, I like to sing very loud, so I'm going to, if you see me exit and go downstairs, I'll leave that door open. <laughs> Um, I announced that uh, 
Anya would be going to University of Regina in the fall, and we're really excited, so I wanted to make that announcement separate from this one. Part two, um, Derek and I are moving to Saskatchewan. Uh, we are moving on um, in <coughs> June, trying to get through this. Um, we are, yeah, we're going to move to Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan in June, and um, that's all I want to say right now, <laughs> without crying. <laughs> Also, what I'm thankful for, I'm looking at all these rocks here, I'm thankful that the organizing committee has decided not to move that big, huge rock out there. That would be kind of hard to put on that. Anyway. Okay. We get started, I guess. Come, let us worship. We light these candles, symbolizing that the sacred is with us always, even in our times of wandering. Scripture says for gathering stones, and a time to scatter them. During this season, we call Lent, it will be for us a time of gathering them, seeing them, holding them, but also a time of listening to them. What wisdom might they offer, we wonder. The earth, of course, is itself simply one large spinning rock orbiting some 150 million kilometers from its star its life source. For millions of years, slowly, slowly, life formed on this spinning rock, increasing in diversity and complexity. Then for millennia, our ancestors made paths, gathered wood and stone, built homes, built community together. Here in this part of the rock, our earth, in this neighborhood called Treaty One, the traditional lands of the indigenous nations, ancestors walked hunted, prayed, loved, and welcomed people who came from other nations without realizing the dangers. We honor them, grateful for their wisdom, their teachings. In Revelations, it says, to the ones who overcome, God will give a white stone on which is written a new name, which no one knows except the one who receives it, a new identity. Jacob was running from his brother Esau that night, the brother he'd tricked to gain advantage. After the sun had set, he took one of the stones, put it under his head, and lay down to sleep. It was then that he had his dream of a ladder or a stairway up to the sky, on which the angels were ascending and descending. He heard a great voice saying, I am the Lord your God, the God of your ancestors, and I will give you this land, the land of which you are lying and your descendants will be a great nation. He would later become Israel, a new identity, the personification of the nation. Not much comfort in that stone though, cold comfort. Why a stone for a pillow? Why would Jacob, God wrestler, God's people personified, be giving such a cold hard comfort? Our third rocks remind us of the role of adversity, of pain in human experience. White stones, night stones, what are the rocks telling us? God waits for stones to melt, for peace to speed, for hearts to hold each other's need, until we understand that Christ Isaiah can. 
Hey, all you who are thirsty, come drink from the water. All of you who have got no money, you can buy wine and bread. No cost, it's free. Grace can startle us. That's part of the reason we gather online, or now that we can in person once again. We gather and scatter. Our souls connect for these moments. And then we disperse to live as God's children, God's allies. We are grateful for connection, connection with each other and with God. It makes living not only bearable, but often enough to keep us going, joyful and triumphant. Let's take a moment to pray. O oh God, take these moments, take these hearts, take our dreams and our fears, take both our hopes and our dreads, take us and reshape us through this encounter. Reshape us both as a community and as individuals, navigating through the widening circles we inhabit. Take hold of us in this worship until blessed and transformed by your grace, we're once again ready to take hold of our living and our loving in this your beautiful, aching world. My soul cries out with a joyful shout that the God of my heart is great. And my spirit sings of the wondrous things that you bring to the ones who wait. You fixed your sight on your servant's light, and my weaknesses did not spurn. So from east to west shall my name be blessed, could the world be about to turn. My heart shall sing of the day you bring, let the fires of your justice burn. Wipe away all tears, for the dawn draws near, and the world is about to turn. From the halls of power to the fortress tower, not a stone will be left on stone. Let the king beware, for your justice tears every tyrant from his throne. The hungry poor shall weep no more for the food they can never earn. There are tables spread, every mouth be fed, for the world is about to turn. My heart shall sing on the day you bring, let the fires of your justice burn. Wipe away all tears, for the dawn draws near, and the world is about to turn. Though the nations rage from age to age, we remember holds us fast. God's mercy must deliver us from the conqueror's crushing grasp. This saving word that our forebears heard is the promise which holds us bound. Till the spear and rod can be crushed by God, who is turning the world around. My heart shall sing of the day you bring, let the fires of your justice burn. Wipe away all tears, for the dawn draws near, and the world is about to turn. Indigenous peoples' spirituality is rooted in their connection to nature, the earth, and one another. They had creation stories and a spiritual perspective unique to the history of their people that varied from nation to nation. While they believed in a creator, it differed significantly from other organized religions of the world. In particular, many indigenous people peoples carried a collective belief that everything in their environment possessed a spirit, including the natural world, people, animals, and in some cases, inanimate objects. This belief system ultimately ensured indigenous peoples and their communities maintained a deeply interconnected relationship of respect and balance with nature, 
animals and human life. Maintaining a positive relationship between these components was and is integral to their traditional worldview. Grandfather Rock teachings are based on the understanding that the rocks are grandfathers, animate beings with memories and stories to share with those who are able to hear ancestral voices. The teaching speaks to the respect held for rocks. Indigenous peoples are connected to and have a knowing of the relationship among the rocks, the sands, the water, the plants and the animals, and all aspects of the land. And there is a growing acknowledgement and respect, once again, for these traditional insights. There are different versions of this teaching and it is with great reverence that I share this one to show that we share common understandings. Indigenous people have a spiritual relationship with the earth, that all things on the earth are family, and that the Creator gave Indigenous people a sacred duty. They are keepers of the earth. In the beginning, everything existed only in spirit form. These spirits moved around hoping to find a place where they could stay and show themselves. When they reached the sun, they knew it was too hot. Finally, they came upon earth, but it was covered with water and there were no life forms. Suddenly, a great burning rock broke the surface of the water and it began to dry out the land. This rock is called Grandfather Rock because it is the oldest of all the rocks. Rocks must be respected because of this. There is a parallelism of this teaching with a geological description of the history of Earth, which goes something like this. The conditions that led to the formation of the Earth began some 13 billion years ago. Dust and gases moved around through space, unattached to anything. About 4.5 billion years ago, some of these materials came together to form our Sun and others to form the Earth. A fiery earth was born and then cooled to form a solid black surface. Most of that early land was not exposed. It was covered by an ocean that formed from an enormous violent rainstorm which lasted for millions of years. That rainstorm was fed by a blanket of cloud created by gases released into the air from volcanoes. The earth changed from a fiery body to become a water planet. Small, black, volcanic islands born of fire poked out above ocean, the beginning of dry land. That early earth did not have life as we know it. After millions of years, something very special happened. Bacteria appeared. These bacteria ate sunlight and created oxygen, and then life on earth was changed forever. The record of these early bacteria is preserved in rocks as fossils called stroma, stromatolites. Younger examples of the bacteria and stromatolites occur in rocks near Thunder Bay. Geologists consider this early life to be the ancestors of every living thing on earth. Our great, 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 great grandmothers and grandfathers. While the geological story is described in more detail, the similarity with the original Grandfather Rock teaching is striking. It is not about which is correct, for both are valid. It is respectful recognition that both views are remarkably similar and are founded on different but parallel views of the Earth's history. I see that we need to have a respect for each other and our respective cultural and belief systems. And with that I say, Iguasani.
reading is from Isaiah chapter 55 verses 1 to 9. It's an invitation to the thirsty. Say there, is anyone thirsty? 
Come and drink, even if you have no money. Come, take your choice of wine and milk. It's free. Why spend your money on foodstuffs that don't give you strength? Why pay for groceries that don't do you any good? Listen, and I'll tell you where to get good food that fattens up the soul. Come to me with your ears wide open. Listen, for the life of your soul is at stake. I am ready to make an everlasting covenant with you, to give you all the unfailing mercies and love that I had for King David. He proved my power by conquering foreign nations. You also will command the nations, and they will come running to obey, not because of your own power or virtue, but because I, the Lord your God, have glorified you. Seek the Lord while you can find him. Call upon him now while he is near. Let men cast off their wicked deeds. Let them banish from their minds the very thought of doing wrong. Let them turn to the Lord, that he may have mercy upon them and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. This plan of mine is not what you would work out, neither are my thoughts the same as yours. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts than yours. You are my God, I long for you from early morning. My whole being desires you like a dry, warm, waterless land. My soul thirsts for you. I will give thanks as long as I live. I raise my hands in prayer. My soul will be As I lie in bed, I remember you, O God. I think of you all night long, for you are my constant help. Today's musing is a poem to end a difficult week. Jack Gilbert's A Brief for the Defense. The poet reminds us that even amid the worst, worst of human suffering, there is still joy. And perhaps delight is necessary to both wonder and courage in the worst of times. Sorrow everywhere, slaughter everywhere. If babies are not starving someplace, they are starving somewhere else. But we enjoy our lives because that's what God wants. Otherwise, the mornings before summer dawn would not be made so fine. The Bengal tiger would not be fashioned so miraculously well. The poor women at the fountain are laughing together between the suffering they have known and the awfulness in their future, smiling and laughing while somebody in the village is very sick. There is laughter every day in the terrible streets of Calcutta, and the women laugh in the cages of Bombay. If we deny our happiness, resist our satisfaction, we lessen the importance of their deprivation. We must risk delight. We can do without pleasure, but not delight, not enjoyment. We must have the stubbornness to accept our gladness in the ruthless furnace of this world. To make injustice the only measure of our attention is to praise the devil. If the locomotive of the Lord runs down, runs us down, we should give thanks that the end had magnitude. We must admit there will be music despite everything. We stand at the prow again of a small ship, anchored late at night in the tiny port, looking over to the sleeping island. The waterfront is three shuttered cafes and one naked light burning. 
to hear the faint sound of oars in the silence as a rowboat comes slowly out and then goes back is truly worth all the years of sorrow that are to come. Interesting piece, eh? That poem by Jack Gilbert. We can do without pleasure, but not delight. Risk delight, he tells us. <laughs> I love those powerful two-word sentences. Poets are good at that. Wendell Berry, the American poet, author of the Mad Farmer Liberation Front, wrote, Practice Resurrection. That's good. Practice resurrection. And then Rilke once wrote, God ripens. Hmm. He wrote, even when we do not desire it, God ripens. Makes you think. And then, of course, John wrote, Jesus wept. Risk, delight, Gilbert tells us. It, you know, it feels almost inappropriate with what's going on in the world with, with so much pain. But no, this is our call to be in the pain, to let it in, this pain, this agony of human cruelty, and then to not let it define who we are. I've seen too much hate to want to hate myself, said Martin Luther King in that famous speech. And so, with that in mind, let's dive into this wondrous, poetic, profound text in Isaiah. Isaiah, by the way, was apparently in Hebrew an unparalleled writer, at, at least so said the author and survivor Eli Wazal. The text begins, Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts come to the water. Ho? Oh? Well, that word ho is one way of translating the Hebrew word hoi. And that is basically just an introduction. It just means something like hey or ha or even ha. It's kind of an informal shout, like saying, hey, over here. Hey, over here. Everyone who thirsts come to the water. Now, water, of course, is very important to ancient people living in an arid land, a, a desert, where the heat and the lack of water can kill you. You know, it still is like that, really. You might remember uh, about five years ago when four women were arrested in the United States for leaving jugs of water in this desert area, this very hot desert area, where illegal migrants would cross. In fact, something like 50 bodies of skeletons had been found there of people who had died trying to make that crossing, and so they left water. 
they were arrested, charged, and found guilty. As one of the four of them said, if giving water to someone dying of thirst is illegal, what humanity is left in the law? Rules can do that if they're unchecked, if we just blindly follow. Now these words in Isaiah, they were likely written just as the former exiles were returning to Israel, a desolate and broken place. Think Kiev when the Ukrainians start returning. They were poor, and no homes, no money, no food, nothing. Imagine them hearing those words, all of you who have no money, come and buy and eat. Uh, well, that can get you in trouble too, you know. That same year that those poor women were arrested, you might remember that in Tampa that year, seven people were arrested for providing free food to the homeless poor because they didn't have a proper license or insurance for it. Arrested for sharing bread with the hungry. Now, of course, that wasn't entirely new. And three years earlier in the same state, in, in Fort Lauderdale, a 90-year-old man was arrested and fined also for sharing food with the homeless. Hmm. Yeah. Sharing food can be controversial. Makes makes me think of Monsanto, you know? You know, Monsanto who who sued, who has been suing like hundreds of farmers because they dared to save some seed for the next year. The world can seem a crazy place. Come all of you who are poor. Come and buy milk and wine at, at no cost. You don't need to pay. That's always the way it is with God. That's, that's the invite from God, what, what it's like. It's always grace. It's always free, no charge. And yet some of us want to say, ah, there is always a cause. You know, even in the church, we might find ourselves saying, you got to pay you got to do something. We have our membership requirements. you got to be a member in good standing if you want to vote on calling a new minister. Huh? That's one of the formal costs of membership in the church. Then, of course, there's a whole host of unwritten costs. I remember in one church that I was connected with, there was a, a woman who had come to faith recently and, and to sobriety recently. She was just off the streets, really, and she'd been a sex trade worker. That means that she was likely to also have been a victim of sexual abuse as a child, since so many were. Anyways, her idea of dressing up for church wasn't quite the same as the congregation's idea of dressing appropriately for church. She understood. She got the message. And then slowly she drifted away. You might remember a few years back when there was a big to-do between teenage girls or young women and their parents were with the church because of wearing tops where the bra strap would show. Now, the bra strap's just a little bit of colored cloth, but whoa, big deal. You can't come in here like that. Or before that, young boys wearing baseball hats backwards. Oh, I remember one church there was talked to a woman. She was complaining about that. I said, "Well, would you rather have them like not come to church, or like wear baseball hats backwards?" She said, "Well, if they're going to insist on wearing baseball hats like that, I'd rather have them not come at all." She got her wish. You want to come into a church, there's a cost. You got to dress the way we like. But grace is always free, no cost. There's no entrance test, no exam, no membership fees. All you got to do is receive. Let's go back to Isaiah. 
and then this profound sense. Why do you spend money for that which is not bread? Why do you spend money for that which is not nourishing? I don't think this is a rhetorical question. Just sometimes try to answer that. Why are you doing stuff that is not nourishing to you or, or, or to your community or to the people that you love? Well, and because in the ancient Near East, oh, in literature, they love poetic repetition, the next line is pretty similar. It says, why do you toil or work for that which does not satisfy? That made me think of carbs. You know, you crave carbs and and then eat them, but they don't really satisfy. You're hungry again another few minutes. Why are you toiling away for that which can't satisfy, that can't strengthen? There's a few interesting words here. The, the word for money itself is kasef. Now that comes from the Hebrew word kasef, which means longing. Interesting, eh? Longing, money. And that word for toil or for work, Work, it comes from the Hebrew word yagol, which means to become weary. So when you find yourself doing stuff that maybe you don't feel is really all that healthy or, or helpful, I'm sure I'm not the only one that finds themselves doing that. Then just ask yourself those questions. Why are you spending money or time or energy or or emotion on that which does not nourish you or others, does not benefit you or your community, does not feed your soul or strengthen you. You might have a good reason. I just need a 10 minute break, that's all. That's why I do Wordle every day. Well, sure, that's fine, we all need breaks. But just engage in that kind of inner conversation in order to be intentional about what you're doing with your time. This is a key, I think, for us to live well, especially in these days. Isaiah, though, he's still got more to tell. And the next line is really interesting. He said, listen, listen. Okay, that's like the same word said twice, a double command, slightly different, the same word said twice. Okay, make sure, like, really listen. This is important, people. And then he says, listen, listen, eat what is good. Oh, okay, that's not complicated. So instead of feeding all that negative self talk, do you do that? You know, after you make a mistake, do you go through all that negative self talk? Oh, I'm so stupid. I, know, I can't believe I'm such an idiot. Well, don't feed on that. Eat what's good. Feed yourself with what is good. Feed in some constructive, positive self-talk. Yes, I made a mistake. That likely means I'm a human being. My intent was not to harm. And I am learning how to do things differently. Anyways. And then this next line is, delight yourself in rich food. That's how it's translated in, in many translations. But you know that... That word that's translated rich food, it basically just means fat or, or fatness. The word ag, it just means fat or fat, fatness. Now, okay, this is dear to me. I was going to say dear to my heart, but you could say why. Okay? This is dear to me, not my heart, because I love butter. I mean, I would put butter on everything. I'd put butter on potato chips. I love butter. Okay, I know that's not exactly the point of this text. This is really about saying, okay, instead of feeding on the stuff that isn't helpful in your life, why feed on the good stuff? Feed on the constructive stuff. Don't go in for all the lousy, self-deprecating stuff, not the toxic revenge stuff, not the judgmental, how could they do that kind of stuff. Instead, feed on stuff that feeds you, strengthens you. The text is saying, be in control of what you feed yourself. And this is especially right now in times of crisis, any time of crisis. We're in a crisis right now, and there's no denying that. And I think it's going to be long. 
not short. You know, at times of crisis, our anxieties or our resentments, our angers, our hatred can all rise up and, and try to get control. Not just world crises, of course, our own as well. You know, personal crises, family crises. So anytime pain threatens to overwhelm you or, or disappointment casts its pall over anything, anytime that you can feel that anxiety rising up, that those strong feelings that can take over. Just be in control of what you feed yourself, what you're saying to yourself when you're alone. Remember these neural pathways, the, the more we say things to ourselves, the more likely we are to believe they're true. So if we say, oh, I'm so afraid, well, the more likely to think we are. And if we say, well, I, I don't, uh, you know, I'm just such a rotten person, well, the more likely we're going to think that's true. So in this time, let's not do that. What if instead we simply try to focus on what really matters? Just say, okay, uh, what really matters here? What's essential right now? Clarify this. And then ask yourself, well, what do I believe or think about what this is, what, what seems most essential right now? And if you've got a bunch of things, just clarify again. And then say, what am I willing to do about this? It's simple stuff. It's just saying, ah, uh, okay. I can just ooh, let everything calm down. I don't need to understand everything. As far as the sky is above the earth, says the Lord, that's how much my, how much higher my thoughts are than yours. You're not going to figure it out. You don't need to. That, that should comfort us. Now we meet a lot of people who are pretty sure they know what God thinks about who should be in or who should be out. Maybe it's, maybe it's not based on the way the people dress. Maybe it's dressed on, based on whether they're too conservative or too evangelical or whatever. Anyways, but it also should be a comfort to us. Because we don't have to have it all figured out. That's the point here, right? We don't need to have it all figured out. We simply need to trust that there is one beyond our current circumstance who does understand. I am who I am, said God. You don't define me. I define me. And I define you. So we don't need to have it all figured out. We don't need to make big pronouncements. Bonhoeffer, for example, when he was involved in the plot to assassinate Hitler, offered no theological rationale for why he did it. We don't have to have it all figured out in these circumstances. We can live courageously in these moments because we trust in the one who is beyond these moments. We must risk delight, Gilbert wrote. We can do without pleasure, but not delight. We must have the stubbornness to accept our gladness in the ruthless furnace of this world. To make injustice the only measure of our attention is to praise the devil. If the locomotive of the Lord runs us down, we should give thanks that in the end, that the end had magnitude. We must admit, there will be music despite everything. Amen.
deep need. Need for community, need for safety, need for sustenance, need for healing, need for meaning. We live in a world of great abundance. Abundance of money, abundance of courage, abundance of love, abundance of grace. We are the bridge. Human beings are the conduit between abundance and need. Our ability to share, to give, to offer, to serve as a gift for the healing of the earth. Let's pray. Creator, receive the gifts we offer out of, out of the abundance of your world. Bless the gifts we make that they may be used healing our community and our world. Amen. In the past decade, Cuba's socialist government has opened the economy to small businesses. Some Cuban partners of the United Church of Canada provide training to new entrepreneurs. The Pastoral Ministry for People with Disabilities of the Cuban Council of Churches has gone a few steps further. With support from the United Church's Gifts with Vision program, the Pastoral Ministry is helping small farmers with disabilities to improve their livelihoods. Ernesto Gonzalez is the project coordinator. This project emerged as a necessity for people living with disabilities. First, to show the need for inclusion. Then, for showing the capacity people have and also to bring a process of economic improvement. In Cuba, people with disabilities are very vulnerable. The state protects family, but people with disabilities are less able to get jobs. They have less economic independence. This way, in a small step, they can develop abilities, creativity, and contribute to the economy of the family. In our case, we were given money to purchase chickens and other material for their cages and nests. We consumed some of the eggs and we have also traded some of the eggs that we produce with neighbors for vegetables, fruit and milk that we can use. We have also sold eggs in order to have some economic remuneration. Today, to be exact, we have produced 552 eggs. So we have made a good use of the money that we were given. The project involves about 30 families in four provinces of central Cuba. Participants say their efforts are not just for their own benefit, but for the communities around them. They practice what they call a social and solidarity economy. I am raising goats. I bought one male and three females. Two of them have had two babies, so now we have eight, and one more is pregnant. So with that, I have production of milk and share that with children whose family are in need or to help children who can't digest cow's milk. 
We hope to increase our project for sustainable development, giving priority to people with disabilities who have greater needs and people who are sick with children too, giving them some help just as we have received. I am an agronomist by profession and at first I suffered the put down negativity of society. You can't, how can you do this? And I fought back because everything depends on the person. That is a way to lift the self esteem of people. I am sure that many will do great things. There will always be those who go slower or faster because that depends on the capacity of the person. But that motivated me to share this experience with others. I use myself as an example. If I can, you can too. Not everyone is the same, but everyone can do something. That is the most important part. And we give thanks to the United Church of Canada and you who accompany us. Let us take a moment to ponder all that has touched us this day and join our hearts in prayer. Let us pray. Holy One, we think of all the stones in our lives, the stepping stones, the foundation stones, the milestones, and the people who have been for us a rock of security. And we say thank you. In the midst of our anguish and weariness, we see in another's eyes the look of understanding. We know you hear our soul crying out. We say, thank you. In a moment of sunshine and flowing water, we are touched with laughter and joy. and We know we have glimpsed delight. We say, Thank you. In the midst of all that is around us, we pause and know in our hearts you are with us. We say thank you. Oh God, we can't help but bring our fear, our anger, our sadness, our despair. The people of Ukraine have been so courageous and suffered so much. Help us to hold space for the politics of the world in hope and in action. Residential schools have become a symbol of generations of colonial oppression. Help us to confess our complicity and live reconciliation. Racism and prejudice, biased assumptions based on self-interest and privilege are part of our world. Open us to different possibilities and different dreams. The fate of our earth, storms and drought, floods and hurricanes, heat domes, threaten our civilization. Stir us from complacency. O oh God, hear our fear, our anger, our sadness, our despair, and transform it into compassion, kindness, and action.
for our communities and families, we pray. For all who are tired, sick, discouraged, and for those we name in the silence of our hearts. Hold us close, O God. Be for us the rock, the foundation, the stepping stone to new life. We pray together in the name of Jesus, who taught his disciples these words which now we sing. <clears throat> Oh, my God. 